Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Hi, everyone. Welcome. It's been a while since I've been at the Commonwealth Club. Um, a few years to be exact, an entire pandemic. So I'm thrilled to be here tonight to introduce Joshua Sovtel's uh, Stranger at the Gate. And it's a film that I won't give away. You're about to watch it. But what it really does is sometimes is, is turn uh, the things that we think are preconceptions on its head um, and really gives perspective that we just didn't expect. And to me, what it really also did was to remind me of the importance of being connected, of not making assumptions about each other or our lived experiences, but really coming together in community. So that's what we're doing here tonight. And then after the screening, um, my good colleague, dear friend, AC Thompson, journalist at ProPublica and with PBS Frontline will be in conversation with some incredibly special guests, including the director and the protagonists. So please, please enjoy the screening. Um, I'm thrilled to see you all here coming out to enjoy cinema. Please support cinema as much as you can. We need you. Um, and we'll see you after the show. Thank you. When I first saw him, I remember saying that there's something not right with this guy. It was a little scary. He seemed to be like a redneck. He was walking kind of fast, his head was kind of down, pacing back and forth. I was hoping for at least 200 or more dead, injured. You know, he thought he was doing the right thing. He was at war with Muslims in his mind. When I tell people this story, they tell me that they don't believe me. My dad calls my mom the Mother Teresa of the Muslim community, and it's definitely true. I invited him over for dinner. I couldn't help it except to make him feel from my heart that he is welcome. I could never in a million years repay this community what they've given me. So my name is A.C. Thompson. I'm a staff reporter at ProPublica and a producer for the PBS series Frontline. And what a film. This is the, the third time I watched it. And for being about 30 minutes long, I feel like I get something new out of it each time. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our guests here. We have Joshua Seftel, the uh, filmmaker. Uh, we have Mac McKinney and Bibi Barami. And Bibi was born and raised in Besoud, uh, Afghanistan, relocated to Muncie, Indiana, as we learned in 1986, as a refugee during the Soviet war in Afghanistan. You've been a community activist for 30 years plus? <laughs> plus 36 years. 30, in 2002, you founded a nonprofit organization called Awaken Afghani Women's and Kids Education and Necessities which aims to provide health care and basic necessities to women and families in Afghanistan. More recently, as a new wave of refugees has left Afghanistan, Bibi and her colleagues have worked to resettle more than 120 Afghani families here in Indiana. Richard Mack McKinney is an ex-US Marine and soldier who served for 25 years before returning home to Muncie, Indiana. As you saw in the film, he eventually converted to Islam and became the president of the Muncie Islamic Center for two years. He's an active community leader and serves as the skills coach at the largest community mental health center in Indiana. And Joshua Seftel, Emmy Award winning director. In addition to this remarkable work, his other films include uh, Taking on the Kennedys, a whole range of films about uh, Muslim life in America, The Secret Life of Muslims, The Many Sad Fates of Mr. Toledano, and The Political Satire War, which starred uh, John Cusack, Marissa Tomei, Sir Ben Kingsley, etc. Um, and so as a reminder to our audience, 
If you're here with us in the room and you have a question for our speakers, uh, please write it down on one of the question cards and um, give it to uh, one of the folks in the room will bring it up to us. If you're watching online, please put your questions in text chat on YouTube. Um, so thank you all for being here and thank you for um, making this journey out here to, to join us. Um, yeah, like I said, like each time, it's not an epic film, but each time it feels like I'm finding something new in it and I'm seeing like a new, uh, something new about each of the characters and something new about how nicely crafted and how beautifully crafted the, the film is. Um, this time when I watched it, BB, like what really became clear to me is in some ways you're the change agent in this story. You're the catalyst in a lot of ways. And you know, I look at the work that you've done through your activism in Afghanistan, the work that you've done helping people coming to this country, uh, and the way that you embraced Mac when he comes to the center with bad intentions. And I, I wonder, what is it about you that gives you optimism, that gives you the sense that you, one person, can make a meaningful change? Uh, good evening to all of you. I think personally, I think it's a very natural. I have been blessed to be brought up by wonderful parents who always helped and supported and had home for homeless and tried to assist them. And then getting married to my dear husband, Saber, and uh, coming to the United States in 86, my house was always a home of community. And we were like the parents of the community, uh, both of us, and always assisted. When somebody moved into the community, I would invite them to introduce them to other people so that they have someone to uh, be in touch with and understanding. And then, uh, the process being uh, community uh, activists and caring for others, all walks of life, it makes it like natural process for me. That's why when his situation happened in the community, people were scared and they were getting messages and response. I say, wow, like, you know, for me, it was okay to welcome him, to understand him. But some people, this is very common, especially for Muslim. Uh, minorities, we would be scared if you see somebody with this kind of look and coming into the center. I don't blame them, uh, especially what's happening in our world. I mean, all of us are scared. But for me, it was kind of natural that, you know, I see the vulnerability in him and just kind of comforting him and welcoming him and, and show the interest that I want to know who this person is. And I think that kind of helped me. It helped you? This, it helped me to comfort him. And obviously, if I want to help myself and I'm comfortable with it, the other person automatically gets comforted. Right. And that's how I feel about it. Yeah, it is, it, for me, it was really moving because it can be hard in these mm -hmm. grim times to have optimism. And I see you and I see that hope that you have. And it was, uh, it was inspiring to me. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Mac, um, I've interviewed a lot of military veterans and a thing that I hear from them oftentimes is they say they felt lost when they left the service, that they felt they didn't have a sense of mission, that they had lost, like you say in the film, their community. Um, personally, like my father served in the U.S. Army and I can tell you, I don't think he liked another job he did after he left the Army. I think he disliked all of his, yeah. his employers. Yeah. Can you tell us more about why it was painful for you to leave the armed forces. Yeah, sure. Uh, I want to thank everybody for inviting me here tonight. This is, uh, I, 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 I love to see people and I love to hear feedback about the film. Um, the um, thing with me was I didn't want out. I didn't want to retire. Um, I was forced out because I got wounded in Iraq. And I was already over 20 years, and they said, it's time to go, buddy. Hey, I didn't want to leave. I actually laid in a hospital bed and told them I, that I need to go back to Iraq. And they said, what for? I told them, I said, I'm not done killing Muslims yet. Uh, so I was in a very dark place anyway. 
uh, as you can see by the film. Uh, I was that person. Uh, but as the film shows, you know, change is possible. You know, today in our times, I mean, you know, we have the, the world that we live in, the society that we're all a part of. It's scary. It's very scary. Uh, because there's still a lot of people out there like me. But rest assured, as you've seen, change is possible. Thank you. Yeah. Joshua, I'm so, I'm so intrigued. Like, how did you find this story and what, what told you this is the story I need to share with the world? So I was, uh, I was feeling kind of depressed about um, our world the last few years. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, you know, when I grew up in upstate New York as a little kid, I faced a lot of anti-Semitism and, um, you know, name calling and kids threw pennies at me to remind me that like Jews are cheap. Um, someone threw a rock the size of a brick through the front window of our house, like just stuff like that. So after 9-11, I was already and a, a filmmaker at that point, I um, saw my Muslim friends facing hatred and I thought like, oh, I know what this is. Maybe I can do something. So I started making films about American Muslims and trying to tell their stories and give a platform to people to tell their stories. Mm -hmm. And that was in 2016 I started, so eight years ago. And uh, this film is the 25th film in that, in that body work that we've been doing. And um, when I, I read about the story in, in a newspaper article about Mac, and it was like, oh my God, this is a crazy story. And then <laughs> when I met Bibi and Saber, who Saber is here tonight, by the way. Saber, do you want to stand up? <laughs> When I met Bibi and Zabar, you know, I talked about that feeling of like hopelessness and feeling depressed about our world. You know, I met these two people and I was like, oh, wait a second. <laughs> like, maybe there is hope. Maybe there is a way to be in this world that can, can heal it. And I just wanted to share their story uh, with as many people as possible. Yeah, I can. <laughs> <laughs> Makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, here's a question for you. Had there been other instances where, where non-Muslims showed up at the Islamic Center, kind of unannounced and out of the blue before, before Mac arrived? Uh, personally, I don't remember, but we had uh, always, I mean, again, uh, my life commitment was after 9-11 with many ways for my community. I started, a, I'm a co-founder of Interfaith. I started Interfaith in the community and I will host the Interfaith dinner at the Islamic Center to invite all seven religion or other people who would like to come. They don't believe in religion. I would say anybody is welcome. We are part like dinner. Uh, we had done like for the students, religious classes to come to the Islamic Center on Friday from Monday, several university that they could come and learn. We have welcomed the non-Muslim. Students have come and they were always a welcome place for them. And that was never in the intent that somebody would do anything as suspicious because there were students, they will attend and will always welcome them for education reason. But nothing like this kind of suspicion. I mean, these, I think Mac was the first one that people were suspicious and they were scared. I, I heard a story about you. I heard that you used to intentionally invite people that you heard were not fond of Muslims to have dinner <laughs> with you and to chat and to try to change their minds and introduce them to something. Is, that, is this true? <laughs> I do this a lot. I mean, I, know, I don't know, I'm a busy person, but even when I was taking class in the Ball State University, we were watching a film and then I had a student on my right side and one on the left side, a boy and a girl, and we were watching a news about uh, Iraq war in that time and they say, you know, my parents hate Muslim. And uh, the girl on my right and the boy on my left. And I say, 
I'm so sorry, I feel sorry for your parents. Can I invite them over for dinner? <laughs> so that I don't want them to, uh, like, you know, we're in the end of, we don't know when our time ends, but I say in this age, that they have all this hates in their heart. Can I invite them over for dinner so they can recover from this and have a better understanding? Because I have done it, I have uh, spoken to the club, very conservative club, and when they heard that there was a Muslim invited to speak to us about the woman in Afghanistan, there were some people against that. I said, why do we invite this? And I was hoping and praying that these people who are against it will be uh, pres present when I go. Because the person told me, I said, just to let you know, to be cautious, there were some people against this, but I still want you to come. I bake cookies. Sorry, I couldn't bring any cookies tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I sometimes do bring cookies to my uh, screening. And made some Afghan tea, and I drove like 45 minutes, one hour to this club, and I presented by myself, and uh, in spite of knowing that this area is a little bit, uh, a little weird. I don't know what to call it. I don't want to say a bad word. And uh, when we had this tea and cookies and the conversation was supposed to be 30 minutes conversation, it went to almost one and a half to two hours with the tea, completely. And these people got up, and there was some woman, and they were in tears. They give me a hug, and they say, I had scars in my heart for many years about Muslim, and we watch Fox News, and we hear about it more. And I just when I was just throwing up and I think about Muslim. And you healed my scar. Thank you so much. And not, this is not the first time I have presented in the Rotary Club and others that some elderly guy is just running to me like in tears. That they were shaking that, oh my gosh, I wish I had met Muslim before. So I wouldn't have this feeling for a Muslim, like generalizing, you know, all Muslims are bad. We have bad in every religion and every culture, but that's my thing in my life. And as I say in my community commitment to make it a shine, an example, and a better understanding, even though we live in a small city. And I want that city to be an example to other states. If, if it's my ability, overnight I will not sleep for years to make the whole world a better place. But I know it's a human. <laughs> yeah, thank you. But at least as I could do my community, uh, make it a better place, try with my effort. But and cookies can bring people together. Cookies and food. I'll cook for 300 people, the Afghan meals. I do a fundraiser. My whole community knows about the Afghan food. They all enjoy it. When they miss it, I say, please come over. Sometime I, I give you another site. I invite five people or six people, maybe a small dinner. Then I go to grocery. I might see somebody. I say, oh, come over for dinner. <laughs> And then my husband would go to the door. I said, there will be many surprises. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so who is invited? I will not remember the names. I said, just welcome, the, welcome them as they come. There are surprises here. <laughs> That's another part. Yeah, they're always welcome to the home. Mac, um, I've done a bunch of reporting on, on white supremacists, right-wing extremists, and it took me a long time to get this into my head because I wanted to write all those people off and just say mm -hmm. they are a menace. They will always be a menace. They will always be threatening me personally and people of color and Muslims and Jews in this country and there's nothing you can do with them. And it took me a long time of talking to people who work with uh, people in those movements to help them leave those movements to realize like, oh, Nobody, is, you know, people can change. People can actually transform themselves. And there's a whole world of people doing activism and helping people leave these movements. What do you think needs to happen to get people to sort of make, go on the path that you've gone and leave behind the sort of hater mentality? That's a, that's a very good question. Um, of course, there's the easy answer. Shut your mouth, open your ears turn the TV off, but it, it goes deeper than that. It, it, it truly does. And it, it just, it takes a minute, no more, a minute to change someone's mind, literally. 
I will debate that with, with, any, with anybody. They have to be shown that everything that they're thinking about at the moment or towards a, a, a group of people, whether it be race, ethnicity, or whatever, they're wrong. And this is why. I had a feeling about Islam, Muslims. Uh, some of it had to do with the fact that, well, for a few years, there was a lot of them that were shooting at me. <laughs> that kind of changes your attitudes towards some people. But in all actuality, I can't, I can't even hate them. They were doing the same thing I was doing. They thought they were doing the right thing. I thought I was doing the right thing. Who was doing the right thing? I don't think we'll ever know. But when you look inside yourself and you say, okay, I see something wrong with this person. Just like Saber had said in the film. Just like Bibi was inquisitive in the film. You saw that. It showed that they were willing to go and go that little extra inch, give that minute. And it changed a lot of things. Saved a lot of people. You know, when the first film came out, there was a, a small thing. I was on Secret Life of Muslims. That's how this whole thing actually got started. And when it aired, because of current things that were happening at the time, it actually aired on CBS Sunday morning about three years ago. So it got a lot of views. And with stuff like that, you know, you have comments. Well, you know, Josh had said, don't get too wrapped up in the comments. He said, man, you could put a video up of kittens and puppies and somebody's gonna have something painful to say. <laughs> Again, I always have this thing about hurting my feelings. It's impossible, you can't do it. I've been married too many times. You can't hurt my feelings. <laughs> but there was one comment in there that I will remember to the, my last breath and it's what made everything worthwhile. Every sacrifice, even my latest ex, you know, that relationship didn't work out a lot because of, of this and because of the religion. And, be, you know, there was things that happened in my life that it just wasn't working anymore. But this guy wrote, and I paraphrase because he had quite a colorful vocabulary like the one I used to have. But he said, if a bad dude like you can change the way he thinks about things, I guess I can too. That's it in a nutshell. That took a five and a half minute video to get that response out of him. And I guarantee you he had already started thinking differently halfway through. Yeah. Is it, in, in, to follow up on that, do you think in some ways it's the messenger? If, if a simple, a relatively simple message can get through to people sometimes, it, does it take a special messenger? Well, y yes. Yeah, a lot of times it does. Like, like so, so here I am, this white guy, veteran. Now I'm a Muslim. What? <laughs> you know, it just doesn't, you know, that doesn't really mesh, right? I, I've even had people tell me, well, you can't be a Muslim, you're white. <laughs> okay. Um, but like me, I can get into places and I can talk to people that BB can't, Saber can't, even though BB's went to them places and talked to some of those people, generally speaking, she's not going to be welcomed enough to actually say anything. Right? I am. Uh, call it white privilege. I have no problems with that because I know I have it, I accept it, and I'm going to use it. Mm. That's it. Joshua, watching this again, it, I want to I ask you a, a question. You guys can all weigh in on this too. In a lot of ways, it feels like we are still living in the post-9-11 era. And 
I get this feeling from watching the film that there's something that happens about being at war for two decades and that it has this tendency to corrupt and um, damage us far beyond what happens on the battlefield and sort of the ways that it can damage a society we don't even, can't even predict. Is that your sense that in some ways this work you're doing, we're still living in the shadow of 9-11 and the wars that came out of it? It sure feels like it. Um, I do think in some ways things have gotten better since I started the series eight years ago. In some ways, I do think people have changed. Bibi and I were talking about this on the way over here, um, that things have changed a little. And um, I think in the last few years, uh, you know, even Bibi has said she feels like she's more included and it has more of a voice. Uh, and I think, so I do think things are, are shifting, but um, I feel like I've sort of had this epiphany recently going around with this film that like, I don't think hate is ever going to go away. I think it just keeps popping. It's more like a game of whack-a-mole, you know? Yeah. It's just going to keep popping up in different ways. And we just have to be vigilant and find ways to, you know, confront it and to educate people and to keep moving, keep pushing it down. Um, but I don't think it's a battle that can be won. I think it's a battle that we just always are going to have to fight. And mm. that might sound depressing, but <laughs> I think it's a reality. Yeah, yeah well, add to that. I think uh, our society, you know, a human race, if you look at the history, you know, it's a constant struggle. I mean, we are, sometimes I get disappointed with humans' race that, you know, we haven't learned from the history. We continue this, unfortunately. And we lose so many lives, and we watch it every day, like every day shooting, and we lose so many people, uh, children, on a daily basis. And as I say, I wish that could change overnight uh, without in our effort. But I think we're responsible on our daily life uh, to make a better tomorrow with our effort. I mean, we again, this is God's world. We know we cannot change things. What we can do is our best to make a change and hope for a better tomorrow, like uh, in our daily life, in our children, in our school, in our work, at our home. And whether it's through talking, presenting, smiling, uh, whatever way we can be, uh, as opening a door for somebody or making a beautiful documentary through this documentary. Thank you, Josh, for what you have mm -hmm. contributed to this uh, through documentary that we can share this positive message, that we can help each other, we can make a better tomorrow for us and our children, our future grandchildren. I think that's gonna be the focus for us and not to give hopes. Right. If I may say one thing out of that, and I don't mean to get all philosophical because trust me, I'm not that smart anyway, but <laughs> we're never gonna get rid of hatred. Mm -hmm. I know, that's sad. You were probably hoping to come here. No matter how many okay. shirts you wear. Yeah, that's my <laughs> thing, right? That's what I do. <laughs> we're never going to get rid of hatred because we can't, because we can't have non-hatred <laughs> without hatred. It's the whole meaning of you have to have evil in order to have good. You, you just do. I mean, you know, if religions are based on that. You have God, you have the devil good and evil. You have to have that to that parallel, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> but um, we need to get that bit more in balance because the it's it's really off balance right now. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to shoot for. Don't don't set yourself up to get rid of hatred. <laughs> I mean, I I'm, I always preach anti hatred, but I hate lima beans and the New England Patriots. So there you go, right? <laughs> and, and I should add personally that, you know, um, some, some ways that war corrupts us are fairly predictable. If you designate a group the enemy and you wage war on them for 20 years, we should not be ex surprised when we have a rise in hate crimes against members of that community. Um, other things are less predictable. <laughs> Opiate epidemics, suicides, these sort of things that you can also trace in some ways to the, you know, the wars that we've been through and the things that people have gone through 
the PTSD and suffering they've had. Um, mm -hmm. for, for you, Bibi, there was this surge in hate crimes after 9-11 directed at Muslims and people perceived to be Muslim. And it was pretty brutal for a bunch of years. And like you said, Joshua, it kind of died down a little bit. Did you feel that personally? And could you see that wave in your own life? When 9-11 happened, I had uh, uh, five children at that time. And uh, the sixth one was born. And my kids were playing soccer and uh, basketball and different sports, but especially with soccer during that September season. And uh, I now covering, you know, a lot of some Muslim ladies, they don't cover. I mean, they're Muslim, but they don't cover. And sometimes, you know, it's not like identifiable. And then I'll go to soccer field and watching my kids game. And a lot of my friends say, please, Bibi, don't go. I say, you know, what, what do I do? I have children in the field. And I'm not going to be that kind of person to hold myself in the shell. I have to better understand. And the first thing we did was in the school, I wrote a letter to the, throughout the school that we condemned this act, what happened in New York, New York. And we're against this. And we went to many churches. I invited actually all the ministers to my house. The first thing I yeah. did, we had a big dinner with all the ministers. <laughs> So the, the religious leader, what can we do to make a better understanding to be proactive? I like to do things like immediately, like uh, to reach out. And I started the interfaith and speaking in churches, in schools, and make children understand. So my children, I remember my son, I am I'm blessed with good children. He was told on the bus that you know, Obama is your uncle. What are you doing here? Some kind of comments on the bus. And to be honest with you, my son never told me. He never responded to that person. And another friend of our neighbors, she's my friend, and she tells me later, do you know that Yusuf was told this and this? And then that kid was off the bus for like a week or two or some time. I had no idea. And I heard it from my neighbor <laughs> that this happened. You know, things can happen like this. My, bless my children, they can just ignore it. They're very good at this. And. Uh, I think those kind of comments were there. And then my daughter-in-law was told that, like I think that's what I mentioned in the movie, that take your towel back mm. to your country, what you have on your head in the parking lot and some other people's in the mall. They were, uh, I think one of the church, First Presbyterian Church is the biggest church in Muncie. Dr. Ron Naylor, I think, recently I will share with you, uh, Mac had a girlfriend or engaged and we just did his wedding October 15th. And that minister, Dr. Ron Naylor, did his uh, a religious uh, Christian wedding, and my husband did his uh, Islamic wedding in his house. That was a very special time. And Bibi, anyway, cooked, and Bibi cooked all the food. And I, cooked <laughs> it. <laughs> I offered it. I made it happen with my cooking. Uh, and giving little incentive, I said, I will cook to see if you guys get married. Uh, anyway, <laughs> Stephanie, his wife, was happy that this happened because, <laughs> and that Ron Naylor, I think, uh, in the mall, there were some Muslim students from Saudi Arabia, they were attacked during that time, and then, actually, Ron Naylor had, uh, oh, when I invited the minister, we wrote a letter in the Sunday paper every Sunday to educate our community about what's happening. And we, t we took a turn. And then when that happened in the mall, he invited us to the church, and that's the biggest church, and my husband and I, we talked in the church and tried to make people understand. And he was very proactive on this. And he was very, he's very open-minded, very well versed on the human and understanding and the Jesus and all his religious part. It's his beautiful uh, contribution to our community. He had done a lot of good work in our community. But I think that helped a lot. Mm. Personally, I'm uh, blessed to be a very positive person. And I think that reaction has always come back to me. And that is, I respect all, all people. And I think I was respected. I have not had that kind of a personal story that I can share. But I can share some of the others in the community that I have stood up for it. And I have talked to the people. Whether it was on Facebook, I have responded to it very positively. For example, when we did the reset of the refugee, there was a comment, oh, we have uh, our own people here suffering, homeless. And I'd say, I will be the first one to help with that suffering. Please let me know how can we 
stand up for that and take care of it. And I'll make those kind of comment that people have the negative thing will go away, that I'm, I'm the first one to help with that, regardless who they are, what race and group they are. I think that kind of comments does help and gives hopes to people. To be supportive when, be they're, supportive feel, when they feel under when attack. When they're feeling under attack, exactly. I think that's my way to respond. And, and you feel like today maybe things are, are better than right after 9-11? I always oh, see much better since 9-11. I think there may be still some hate going on. As you say, we cannot get rid of. We are totally blessed, the new generation, the young people who are educated, the Muslim people who are working. I'm so proud to see that like, we were in Michigan, Detroit, some of these Muslim, they came, they're working in the White House and other field and legal issue. I mean, I think things are much better education-wise. I think I'm, I'm very strong believer of education. These young women and young guys are working in different fields and making a positive impact wherever they are. I think that's helping a lot. I can see a big difference than before 9-11. That's great. Yes, a big difference. That's great. Yeah, thank you. Mac, um, when I've been speaking to researchers about extremism and political violence and racial violence, the kind of stuff that you were intending to engage in, they point out to me trauma that almost invariably somebody who's going to engage in this type of spectacular act of violence has suffered some serious trauma that has not been dealt with. And I wanna ask you, you know, for what you've been through in combat and, and in the armed forces, like how does being in life and death situations and being wounded and seeing people die and killing people reprogram you and, and possibly push you in a direction that, like this that's really disastrous? Hmm. I know it's a lot. No, it's, um, I have often stated, and sometimes it's very unpopular with, with other people, but people, uh, just out on the streets that, that murder, murders. Uh, at least temporary insanity is a very valid defense. Because, I mean, I don't know anybody here. I don't know what your backgrounds are. But, but I will tell you that mm. the normal Joe on the street, no matter how much he hates, no matter how, how, much, how mad he may be, how, how often he says, well, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him. No, they're not. No, he's not. Because he can't. We're not made that way. We're not. The military has spent millions upon millions of dollars of psychological research on how to flip that switch. And that's why at least your combat arms fields in the military, so it's such a harsh lifestyle. Because they got to know that when time comes, you can flip that switch. I get real nervous around people it, back home. You go to Walmart and you'll see people with pistols on their hips. It made me a nervous wreck. Because I would venture to say that almost all of them, if they were actually able to pull that pistol and extend that arm, they could never pull the trigger. It's a lot of emotion from here to here. A lot of emotion. I, my switch was broke. <laughs> I, I had accumulated so much in my life towards being the best at what I did. And I mean, because of that, I, I, I was able to even stay in the military. I, got in, I was in trouble every time. Up until the time I made staff sergeant, I, I was every rank at least twice. <laughs> you know, I remember getting out of jail on a Monday morning, going in front of my captain, and he looked me in the eye and he says, Mac, he said, you're the best damn Marine I've ever seen from 0730 to 1630. But after we sound Liberty Call, you ain't worth a hoot. It's true. That's the only time I live for. 
drinking became a problem. It's how you quieted the demon, you know? And it got to be, when I was younger, I was the life of the party. But in the end, I would just sit there every night and get drunk and cry. Because it hurt. What I had planned ultimately was my way out. Suicide by cop, I guess. Because I knew I'd get caught. And I knew I'd end up in a federal prison eventually with a needle in my arm. It's my way out. To me, that was a way of going out dignity, you know, with some kind of dignity. Because they took that away from me when they made me leave the military. The one thing I like about this film the most, actually, is because, first and foremost, it's not really about me. It's about situations. It's about our society. I have been called a hero because of this. If you think, if you watch this tonight and think that I'm the hero, watch it again. It's on YouTube. There's the hero. Her husband is the hero. Their son, their family. That whole community, that whole Islamic community of Muncie are the heroes. My daughter is a hero. I could never, like I said, in a million years, there's no way I could ever repay what they've given me. You know, I don't have a good relationship with my family. It's been very estranged since I ran away from home when I was 17. And, and it, now that I'm a Muslim, it's even worse. Uh, uh, this is my family. Right? I mean, I got remarried. They were there. My family wasn't interested. My biological family. They're the heroes. There is not enough ink in this world to write the thank you notes that they deserve. Mm -hmm. It's not. Mac, I, I have some uh, questions from the audience for the panel. You, are you guys down for that? Yeah. Okay. So I have one for I have one for for Bibi, uh, and the questioner says, "I am most astonished that Ms. Barami's reaction to learning of Max's plans was to invite him to her home for dinner. We are so polarized and distrusting of the other. Where does the impulse come from to embrace one's antagonist?" Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> My easy answer is. Uh, to be honest with you, as I say, it's very natural to me, and I'm, I had a very crazy busy life always, uh, do too many things. And whenever I see a situation, the best way it, it is to invite them over to my house, that gives me opportunity to get to know that person, and I can ask questions, I could know what this, the problem is. And that's exactly why I did it. I mean, that, was, it, that happens to other people, too. Like recently, my husband mentioned to me there are some families from, because I've been extremely busy with the refugees, from somewhere. And he said, I see these people coming to the prayer, Friday prayer, but I don't know their names, I say, because I haven't invited them to the house. That's why you don't know them. And now whenever I invited them, then you get to know them, who they are individually, give them attention and respect. And I think that may be, the answer to that, that's why, <laughs> that's why I did it, honestly, because even to let you know, he converted, I mean, to Islam. And my community member were even more scared <laughs> that this may be the way he's getting mm. more in end. And I was still hearing, that's what I say, I will invite, and I invited those individuals, well, not everybody, but there were certain people really paranoid, they will not come to the center. And I invited those individuals. I said, this gives us opportunity to sit down and have a meal. And when I asked that question, after I was done with the kitchen, and I sat down, I said, what were you thinking, Brother Rick? 
And so that it gives the, those people who are sitting at the table opportunity to talk about this in open subject. I'm all about breaking the ice and just starting the conversation. <laughs> and then everybody kind of took it from there. That was kind of the answer. One wow. of the things I think is amazing too is that Bibi remembers exactly what she cooked for him. <laughs> And, 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 how, and how much he ate and what he liked. And, and, and what did you cook? I get, I get blamed for his weight. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I weighed 190 pounds before I went to her house. <laughs> I had cooked uh, kabuli palau for him with the carrots and raisin and chapli kebab, that's very famous, and lamb. I, mean, I make it roasted or I make it curry and spinach and salad and Bibi's cookies, of course, for dessert. <laughs> and the Afghan bread. He ate every bit, every bit of it, and he served himself second and third. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Wow. And, and Mac, I have one for you from the audience. I want to get this right. You served both in the Marine Corps and in the Army, is that right? I joined the Marine Corps and retired from the Army. Tried to be a civilian in between there for a couple of years. Boy, that was a bad idea. <laughs> So this question has a great question, and it says, how have other ex-Marines, and we'll broaden that out to soldiers as well, reacted to your conversion? Has the film been shown to, to ex-Marine groups or to ex-Army groups? Uh, we're actually working on that. Um, from what I've been told, we're going to get, we're going to try to get it out there to some veterans groups. Uh, hopefully dealing with tra trauma or having feelings. I, I, I will be, you know, it, I guess a little bo uh, bolsterous here. I, I think I'm the only one that I actually associated with that hated the way I did. I even had buddies that would tell me that knew how much I hated Muslims would tell me, dude, you got to chill, man. <laughs> <laughs> you're, go you're over the edge. And, uh, but... That is in the works. Uh, those things take time, though, because, um, you know, the whole acceptance thing and it's but but it is being worked on. So, um, yeah, but I did want to clarify one thing. Mm. It, it's former Marine, ex-soldier. OK. Yeah. It's. We're there, and just a little more about the film. You know, it just came out, so it's been out for a few weeks and this um, in the coming year, in a few months, we're going to begin working with um, Facing History in Ourselves, which is a group, I, I think someone might even be here from the group, yep. Uh, the amazing organization, and I, that, tell me if I'm getting this right, you have teachers in 170,000 teachers? Across is, the country. Across the country. Mm -hmm. uh, and this film will be part of the curriculum, so it will be taught and shared with um, middle and high school students um, of 170,000 teachers. Um, so it, this film will be out in the world in a big way. And we're also, as Max said, having plans to do outreach in veteran communities, evangelical communities, and others. So we have a lot of work ahead of us. Um, when we showed the film at, the, um, at BB's mosque, uh, when we finished it and before we shared it with the world, we had a screening, and Mac was there, and mm -hmm. I think probably 80 members of the uh, yeah. of the um, mosque were there. And mm -hmm. when it was over, one of them stood up and said, uh, "We need to make sure that every American sees this film, mm -hmm. and we're we're trying to live up to that in some <laughs> way." So that's our goal. Yeah, I think the goal is after this gets, uh, we appreciate everybody's support on this great message. And as when people were scared of a Mac at the Islamic Center, then I met him as our policeman. Every time I had an event, and mm. I would tell him that you watch around. And I think after this film gets more out and our busy time is over, I think he needs to go around the world, <laughs> I mean, around the country here and show this to the Marines and different. I think it would be important. I got one more quick question for you. Um, we have an audience member who says, Mac, what proof were you looking for at the center when you went there? What did you think you were going to find? Well, it, it, see, I, I was like a lot of other Americans. I, you know, I'm a Fox News alumni. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 of course, having been in their countries and, again, being shot at by them, I thought I knew what I was talking about. I thought I knew the truth, but I, I didn't have the tangible proof. And really, I was more concerned with 
being able to, because I knew I would, like I said, I knew I'd get caught, I knew I'd be in court, and I'd have my day. I'd be able to stand up. It wouldn't help me any. It usually doesn't when I open my mouth, but it wouldn't help me any. But I would be able to say my piece, and I would be able to say, right here. It's in their book, right there. And I was so happy when they handed me a Quran. And I tell this to a lot of other Muslims. If someone wants to learn about Islam, hand them a Quran. Tell them to come find you when they got questions. Because that's what he told me, and that's what I did. Like I, like I said, or you know, like Jomo had said, I was there. All, I was there a lot. You know, I, I make the joke it wasn't Ramadan, so I was there more than most of the Muslims were. Uh, if if you're not Muslim, you wouldn't get that, but that's okay. <laughs> but uh, so so I, I was getting to know this, and I would find stuff in the in the Quran that corroborated, or you know, w with what I felt and what I thought I knew, right? And then I would go back for the explanation, mm -hmm. and I'd listen to what they said, not truly believing what they would say. But then I would go back and I researched it. My bomb was built. It was done. I didn't need to work on that. Now I was just doing the support work for the aftermath. And when I researched it and really delved into it, they were right. Yeah. Contextualizing. That's what happens. I oh. thought you told me that uh, also you wanted to prove to uh, your daughter, Emily, like, you know, obviously when you go to the Islamic Center, these are horrible people, mm -hmm. and they will do something to you, and then you come back with that message, see that this is what I told you, that these are bad people. Yeah. yeah. That you will prove it even double, because that's why you went to the center, that somebody's going to attack you. Mm -hmm. Somebody's going to kick you out of there. What are you doing here? Mm -hmm. Instead, they ask you, oh, are you okay? That's, that, that's the message I got from him mm -hmm. that he wanted to prove before. He mentioned to me that uh, many, many times that this is what he didn't know when he come in what is going to happen to him. He was shaking and he was nervous and uh, he wanted to prove it to especially his daughter. He, she was courageous. Like she, he couldn't believe that why is... The father mad, you know, innocent children. I love children. That's one of my <laughs> uh, weakness. I love children. They, they will say that, why would you do that? If I even make a, a little comments, and my children will say, oh, that's mom, that's a little bit close to racism. Do not say this word. And I'm so proud to have that children. I mean, children are very uh, sincere and uh, thoughtful and understanding, like, why, this, why is my father so upset? And that's why he wanted to prove to them. And that's like my ex-wife had said in the, in the film, that if they would have treated me differently, it would have been a whole other story, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But in my learning about what Islam really was, they were acting Islamically towards me. Now, would have that happened if I would have went to another mosque in another state, in another city, somewhere else? I don't know. I don't know. Muslims aren't perfect. Christians aren't perfect. Jews are not perfect. There's perfection within their beliefs. But within them, their personalities, nah, we're very imperfect. All of us. But when we can try to achieve a certain level of who we're supposed to be, to change the world. Change the world. Thank you all so much. I want to have us all give thanks to Bibi Barami, Mac McKinney, Joshua Seftel. What a great conversation, great film. Yeah. 
Yeah, I wish we could yeah. keep going. <laughs> <laughs> and so if you'd like to watch uh, more Commonwealth Club programs and support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making both virtual and in-person programming like this possible, uh, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash online. Thank you all so much for being part of this and uh, helping us have this conversation tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.